Hi everyone, welcome back to a brand new episode with Ami and myself, where we invite awesome people to talk about what they do, what they love, and uh, show us maybe some cool stuff that they've done in the journey. So today we have uh, Doug Wood, uh, one of uh, our honored guests, and we are having connected on LinkedIn for a long time now, and we've been talking once in a while. And uh, yeah, so maybe you could say a couple of words about yourself, uh, your name, where you come from, where you live, what you do. Yeah, sure. Um, so my name is Dougie Wood. I am, well, traditionally, I'm, I was a SharePoint consultant for the past 10, 12 years, something like that. I lose track now. Um, but it's led me on a slightly different path in the past couple of years. I was a SharePoint consultant for a long period of time, and I wore a lot of different hats. Every type of role that you can think of, SharePoint consultant, SharePoint analyst, SharePoint developer, SharePoint project manager, Every, every role. Um, I did a bit of Power Platform. So for a few years, I headed up a Power Platform team, a development team, about 10 people, something like that. And wow. in the past in the past two years, I'll just, <laughs> just finish off. The past two years, I've been focusing at my job title is actually creative director. So what I do now is I'm essentially a marketing director for a um, Microsoft partner. And I spend a lot of my time creating materials, content, YouTube videos, events, webinars, things like that. So that's what I tend to fill a lot of my days with these days. Awesome. Uh, does that mean you also have a background in, in um, design and, or in K art kind or of. something like that? Do you have some uh, background in that or it was on the way you... It was kind of on the way, to be honest. I mean, something I kind of found... Um, I, I've always been interested in trying to make things look better. So the, the stereotype of both SharePoint and Power Apps, as in Canvas Power Apps, is that they're ugly, that they just really don't look good, clunky, horrible things. Um, they've, come, they've come a long way, though, if you remember. Yes, that they, they have. They have, exactly. But traditionally, that was yeah. always the case, and it was always something that, that was um, an uphill battle because I started working with SharePoint when it was SharePoint 2003. It was the first version of SharePoint I used. And then SharePoint 2007, 10, 13. And then when it kind of transitioned to 16 was about the time that I transitioned into SharePoint Online and started using mm -hmm. that. And I, I love SharePoint Online. And that that's what I, I basically built my whole career at that point. I, it was kind of at a pivotal point. that I think if I hadn't found SharePoint Online, I probably wouldn't have done SharePoint going forward. Um, just because I'm, I'm not, and I hold my hands up. I'm not. Weirdly, as an MVP, I'm, I'm not a techie tech person. Um, so I'm not overly. Well, I don't. I'm not into kind of servers and networking and um, SQL and all that sort of stuff. Nor from a development perspective, am I a pro coder? So with SharePoint, I always found my niche was actually when it was I was using SharePoint. It was um, InfoPath that I used for designing mm -hmm. forms and that sort of thing. And then when it was SharePoint Online, it sort of transitioned and then it became Power Apps instead of InfoPath. Um, and that was kind of always my niche to make something look better without using pro code. Yeah. So so you've you've been using uh, SharePoint also, yeah, maybe maybe as a little bit of a back end for Canvas mm -hmm. apps and so on, or or customizing like forms uh, with Canvas apps or both. But both, yeah. So for, for a long period of time, I was heading up a team that was predominantly building Canvas apps. And because, because we, we had the background in SharePoint, it was a obvious move to use SharePoint lists and things like that to, to be the back end of Canvas apps. Um, I found it a really tricky transition um, to go from that to then start working with the likes of model-driven apps, Power Apps pages, which used to be called Power Apps portals, Things like that, because actually, if, if 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 we're honest, it's Dynamics. That that's what it is. It's you have to understand how Dynamics three six five works and how all that works. So it was, it was quite alien. Um, so to become an actual, I, I am now a certified as a Power Platform um, solution architect. So I've got the PL six hundred exam and all that sort of stuff. Um, but that was the hardest part for me was to actually transition to understanding DataVerse and all of that side of things. 
I I found actually I can tell you as I'm I I consider myself an expert in SharePoint, so I know all of the features. But if you want a beautiful SharePoint site, then I think you need in in the team a designer that can put the correct pictures, the correct mm -hmm. colors, the theme of of the whole site. It can be the theme of the company, and technically yeah. I can do it, but you need somebody that can give them the artistical or the design to put the right picture and, and yeah. size and dimension that will also fit for mobile and the yeah. tech. Yeah. yeah. So do you it's agree? So so so, so I, I do go down that kind of path. I do do quite a bit of that. And but to be honest, as I said, I I don't I don't necessarily deliver myself SharePoint projects on a day-to-day -day basis anymore. Um, but when I did, I used to breathe a sigh of relief when somebody said they had a graphic designer in-house or that they yeah. had budgets for a graphic designer or something like that. Because although I yeah, I technically can do those things, people underestimate the time that it takes to understand the brand, its colors, its themes, its it, the imagery that's going to be used, all that sort of It takes a lot of time to do all that stuff. So if they've already got a graphic designer which understands that, it makes my life as the SharePoint consultant 10 times easier because huh. I know that I could just say, look, I need these types of images in this type of way. This is the limitations. These are the color palettes that we could possibly use and things like that. But I need you to kind of bring those assets to me. Th that makes a life of a SharePoint consultant way easier. Yeah. I, I agree. And, with and, 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 and in SharePoint where at, at an extent, you 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 already have like a structure of navigating and where the lists are, where the sites are, and so on. But when you talk about Power Apps, I'm going to talk about a little bit more about Power Platform since I'm a Power Platform consultant. So Power Apps, Power BI, you start from from blank usually. Mm. So if you don't have like some some kind of a feeling of UI UX design, you're you're lost. I mean, your your app or your report mm. is going to be a mess. So yeah. I, I am twenty times happy if I hear that the Customer has a has a the graphic designer or a UX designer, uh, which mm. which are ready to help and and let us just give us like a mock up or a click dummy. Uh, here we want to click, we want that to happen, we want this transition to have, and I'm happy to 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 grind and put that uh, implement mm. code down. But uh, thinking out of of, of, the, of it uh, of, by myself, I I also find it a lot difficult. I think it's something which is often overlooked as part of a Power Apps project. Um, no. When you're talking Canvas Power Apps, is is the design and the and you just yeah. said user experience, the UX part of it. No. And often it is something that makes huge difference. In fact, actually, I can't remember the name of the study, but there was something that was done in America where they took a group on um, like a, like a peer sort of review group, a sort of um, focus group, if you like. And they gave them two different applications, not Power Apps. This is just this is a UX test. They gave them yeah. two two apps, and they were calculators. And one of the calculators, it looked perfect. It looked immaculate. It looked like it was being designed by Apple. It was smooth and sexy, and had nice rounded buttons, things like that. But one in ten times, it got the calculation wrong. <laughs> <laughs> the, the other app. The other app, which is a calculator, looked hideous, awful. Windows it XP. Looked, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it looked terrible, absolutely, uh, like, whatever. But every single time, 100% of the time, it worked every single time, every calculation. And then they asked the focus group, which app do you prefer better? And which app do they chose? They chose one that no looked better. The first looked one. Better. Exactly, exactly. So the one that looked better. So I think their study, they published but it. Are using it. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so no, they they used it, they tested it, oh, they, they played it around with it. Yeah, yeah, no, they 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 played around with it. They they knew as a focus group that one in ten times these calculations were wrong. They still chose it anyway because there's an unconscious human mm. element to this that we we go after things which look nicer, look prettier. In the world of design, things like odd numbers and and even like when we're looking at this now, there's three of us in in three squares. That looks quite nice. And actually, patterns often follow kind of odd numbers and things like that. So there's there's little kind of things that we don't really realize why we like something. But it, it, we, kn I always say this when I was kind of working as the head of software development. We can easily tell what we don't like, but we can also tell what we do like. And it's quite 
challenging sometimes to 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 get that right it's quite and i often find especially developers can't put into words what's wrong with something but they know something isn't right so they pass it to a ux designer or myself to look at it and say oh actually the reason why this doesn't look right is because there's more space on the left hand side than there is on the yeah. right hand side so if you just move it a few pixels over it's going to look way better it's going to it's going to feel better and and that was what that study essentially showed is that and i think they the, they published it and it was called apps that look better work mm-hmm. better and, and that was their summary yeah. I, th- I think there's some uh, lady, I, I don't remember her name, but she's from the UK and and she takes the power apps and makes them that, like super. That's Christine, right? uh, that uh, Doug, Doug men- uh, mentioned before. Yeah. yeah, I mean, she takes a, 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 a square and then the corners are round and all mm. all together it, it looks better. And uh, <laughs> uh, my question to Inea is, before you make a power app, uh, do you make a like a mock-up or you just um you know how it's gonna look just even before starting and doing all of the um, connecting to the data source and everything yeah. or so, like drawing how it would be or just yeah. specification? God, God no, I'm not I'm not into drawing because if I draw something I'm not even I am going to No, a mock-up for, for this here there will be a, a pie chart and here there would be a yeah, but- so it depends actually on the on the budget that the customer has because if they have if if they are open to that stuff they don't have to have a designer themselves we also have one so they they might be either willing to to have to pay one for one huh, for the budget or to have one so um, if if none none of those um, happen then we don't we don't spend the time for that no? but if yes then either the designer will do it or maybe i do something by myself but we start with figma i don't know if you know figma because figma is also mm-hmm. uh, you can start an app from figma and so you can put the mock-up there and then initialize the and power apps will, will take that as a as a as a structure right so for your ux ui and it's it's very helpful i i wish it would uh, go the next step and let's say if you design a SharePoint page in, in Figma, it you would click and then it would export the page directly to the SharePoint site. I think it doesn't do that yet. You can just design it, but you no. know, if it's already halfway, why don't go the extra mile to 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 do that? Uh, yeah, I mean there are also a lot of a lot of stuff that need to be taken care of. I don't think that's 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 easy to be done. Um, mm-hmm. as I, I see, for example, uh, and this and this is in you now in connection with with uh, what we're going to discuss a little bit later. Uh, so we have prepared also three uh, mistakes that you need to avoid uh, when using uh, SharePoint lists, SharePoints in general. Uh, so stick around until the end for that. Um, is that when you, for example, create a SharePoint list with from an Excel file? Uh, um, if you see how those columns are named, then in the in the in the internal names, it's it's a mess. So um, yeah. I think I think there there are stuff, some stuff there that do not work as they should, uh, and um, it's a bit early. I don't know. What do you think, Dewey? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think design is a bit of a a tricky one um, in general. I, I was actually just going to jump into to something to say about. I worked on a project, um, a f- I say a few months ago, a few years ago now, um, and I've got to be careful what I say because I can't remember how much of it was on on NDA, um, but it was with uh, Sony. So do you know Sony sort of music and that sort of stuff, and they wanted to build a, a, a canvas app that that the long story short, again, I can't be careful what I say. It was all about ordering. Um, music records so sony have sony music and things like that is is about ordering quantities of cds or something like that for example and the app i think a while back ago no it it, it wasn't actually surprising no it was i think tops maybe five well not even five years ago three three years ago maybe three four years ago something like that um and it wasn't necessarily just CD. It, it was kind of like ordering quantities of stuff even like vinyls and cds stickers um basically they own the rights to a lot of different music like um 
all, all, all sorts of bands and groups and yeah. singers and that sort of stuff. So it's ordering kind of stuff like that. Um, and they didn't just want the kind of because they had, they had tried, they'd messed around, they'd created Canvas apps themselves, and they didn't want it just to look um, boring, essentially like an out of the box kind of power app tends to just look like a gallery and a few buttons and a f- form that's lopsided and all that sort of stuff and whatever. So um, that's why I was there to try and help um, come up with a design. And I actually pitched the idea, thinking it was a bit of a joke at first. Um, I said we should make it look like a Sony Walkman. So do you know those kind of like old tape yeah. players from like the 70s, yeah. 80s type of thing, like a really retro, yeah. use like retro colors, really sort of like like blues, yellow. neon greens, yellow, use all that sort of stuff. So we make it look like it's one of those players. And I actually spent so much time, um, I built the design at first, I, I, and I was kicking myself because it was actually a colleague that suggested a way better way of doing this. I spent ages first building it all using shapes so using kind of like different shapes and stuff to make it look 3D and stuff like that and whatever. And some ages on this and there was so many elements on the page. Um, and then eventually someone just said, well, why don't you just use an image in the background? Um, and I was like, oh, like, why, <laughs> why didn't I think of that? Um, so eventually, yeah, so I, I mocked up something uh, using uh, Photoshop or something like that. It was a bit more like an image, and I took into consideration where the galleries would go, where the buttons would go, and just left blank spaces for those types of interactable pieces. But the background was just an image in the end. Um, and then they took it off and they 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 ran with it, and they had people in house that were continuing to build on it, and it became this really big, powerful application that they they continue to use to this day. So. Awesome. Uh, was it used, used uh, internally or also externally? No, just it's just internal use. So it yeah. it was for a team that essentially were just processing orders of things and that sort of stuff. But the, the, when I went to, to see them, they had a really nice office, very modern office. You could tell um, that brand and things like that was very important to them. And that's why they, they just knew they didn't want this kind of just out of the boxy looking power app they wanted it to be branded they wanted it to feel like it was for them and they're all pretty cool kind of do you know i mean trendy kind of people um and and yeah when i suggested the idea of this retro walkman type of app mm-hmm. they all thought it was great so yeah so that's what we went with that's cool <laughs> amazing yeah so should they move to the three tips that we prepared amy do you want to go first yeah, why not? What, what's, okay, what's so my tip: uh, what 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 mistakes to avoid? So um, I think uh, people, especially when they're doing a migration for a file file uh, server um, or, or bringing uh, content from another system or even from a different site, uh, they tend just to put everything in one library. And that's really uh, um, a big mistake because, uh, well, it really depends on how many files we're talking about. But let's say they have, I don't know, 500 um, uh, files and they put it all in one site, in one library, in one folder, and uh, and then forget about it. Um, I, uh, SharePoint has lots of limitations, or, or I, I don't like to, to call it a a limitation. I like to call it. Um, oh, um, actually. So what happens is that um, when you put Microsoft says you can put in one uh, library thirteen or thirty million documents. Yes, but uh, in reality, um, the soft limit is that uh, you should put between uh, ten to thirty thousand uh, files. And the reason is uh, also because the threshold uh, that is for the list uh, of oh, the views. And um, that means that instead of doing that, uh, you should split it uh, to different sites or different libraries based on different content and not put all of your eggs in one uh, place. Because that 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 can cause a really really uh, problem, especially you know if they say if you have more than a hundred thousand uh, items or files, then um, 
uh, breaking inheritance of, of permissions uh, will not work. Renaming names of folders will not work. So um, just to split the data in a wise way, uh, there's no limit of sites you can create. There's no limit of, oh, the limit of libraries is very high. I think it's up to 2,000 in a site. And um, that's my, my advice. And uh, if we're talking about, about that, don't e have too many subsites because uh, one, uh, you will never find uh, subfolders, I mean. Because if you try to look for the data, you, you will not know uh, which folder is actually uh, is the file stored. And uh, there's also a, a limit of 400 characters that you can have uh, for the URL. And uh, that's my recommendation um, on how to... This is a mistake that I know many people do. And uh, if they can avoid it, then just uh, do it wisely, maybe talk to a consultant or... Because what happens is it's garbage in, gar garbage out. And yeah. so, and sometimes you need to restructure your, your data. So that's my tip for awesome. today. Thanks. So maybe also use like uh, metadata and so on. No? Instead of folders, yes, yeah. if possible. Okay, Dirk, you wanna go next? Yeah, sure. Your, um, if I, can I share my screen? Sure. Sure. Um, um, so I just, uh, present, share screen. Uh, Here we are. Okay. Cool. We see so, your um, brilliant. Good stuff. So, uh, my my tip is around again. My kind of niche. Um, and if you're watching this and you and and you think that your SharePoint internet sucks and it looks awful, um, my YouTube channel um, is all about really the, the design elements of SharePoint. I do talk about a lot of other stuff, but my passion really for SharePoint is about trying to make it look better. Um, and one of the kind of things that I would say for people to avoid is space issues. Now, what I mean by that is like how things align on the page. So it's very easy to have web parts which are all out of place. And the easiest way to resolve that, there's a web part that's called Spacer. So if I just mm. edit, my, edit my screen, I'll just show you what I mean. Um, but all of this kind of page, it doesn't just sit like this just naturally i've had to kind of play around with it a little bit to make sure that everything aligns as i want it to so you can see here there's a couple of kind of hidden web parts this is spacer here spacer here spacer here it's really easy to add some space to a page just by clicking on the little plus button we can type in spacer and that will then find the spacer web part we can add that and it's really easy to configure. You just literally just drag it up and down. If I'm totally honest, my, my feedback to Microsoft is that if you were to edit this web part, you can't enter the pixels manually. You have to drag it up and down. And that's the only thing from my perspective, from a UX mm. point of view, is an absolute nightmare. <laughs> because if, you, if you're trying to get it very specific and the exact pixel you want, it can be a bit frustrating. But let's just say, for example, like I've got this spacer underneath this new slider here. If I was to remove that spacer, um, and I'll just then save this as a draft. You'll see that once the page reappears, um, it, it doesn't have enough space between the three dots and the next section of the page. There's, there's yeah. a little bit of padding naturally there, but there's none underneath it. So now it, it looks weird. It looks odd. It looks like there's not enough space. And then that comes back to this point I was saying before about you can't always put your finger on what looks odd about something. Um, but that is like one of them, space issues. Is there an is there equal amount of space on the top of something, or the bottom of something, to the left of something, to the right of something? And that essentially is 80% of the winning formula of why something looks good. is about spacing, it's about alignment, and making sure that everything um, sits yeah. where it should be. 
What, what do you guys think? Yeah, awesome. Uh, it looks so much better. Uh, it looks so much better before with the spacing. Now it looks all cramped up. So um, <laughs> yeah, but but yeah, I can understand that it's a, it's a pain to to align these spacings between the elements in in perfectly mm. if you don't see how many pixels they are. Uh, I would yeah. drive me crazy. <laughs> yeah, I I would say that uh, some people will notice it and others would wouldn't. I personally <laughs> don't don't have a design. So I wouldn't notice, but I believe you that you say that it looks better. And and mm -hmm. one comment about that. I saw the top web part was flipping. The question is, mm -hmm. do you want it? Would the flipping, and uh, should you, the user do the flipping or you let it automatically flip? Because it can at one point be annoying to watch it and see that it's flipping uh, all the time. So it's a consideration to say, let the user uh, flip or do it automatic, or maybe after two or three times, stop it. Just uh, mm. this is what annoyed me from, from that, but it's a personal uh, perspective, but it's, um, but it's, it's, as, as, it's- I suppose you, you've got to think about in reality, how are people seeing this page? It, it's rare that you would sit and look at that for as long as what we just did when I was giving that demonstration. You would probably jump on there, look for something, scroll, but you'd only be in that section for a couple of seconds. So I tend to set the settings, maybe it scrolls every two seconds. You can get it to scroll every one second, I think, but then it literally whizzes past you at a million miles per hour. Um, th th I think it's the sweet spot because people are only going to really be at that sort of part of the page above the fold, what I describe as the fold is, is kind of like, ha as you have to scroll down the page, anything below what you currently see is below the fold. Um, and you will only be in that section for a couple of seconds. So the idea of it automatically scrolling is so that people realize there's more content there than just yeah. one image, essentially. And actually, what I quite like about the user experience of the of this, it, it's that web part is the news web part. It's just that the, the layout is set to carousel for the slider. Yeah. And what I like about it is actually when you start to click through the different images, it stops sliding so that you oh, do oh. regain that control over mm -hmm. kind of whether it slides or not. Um, so I think that you get best of both worlds in that. But I, yeah. it's actually something that gets – when I'm – Talking to people about design and SharePoint, um, it's something that comes up all the time. It's about carousels. How do you create carousels? How do you create sliders and things like that? And it comes from intranet managers who are comms people rather than technical people. And they understand that they need they have multiple messages that they need to get out, need to get in front of people's faces. Um, and in fact, actually, recently, um, uh, I, I did a review of a third-party product that's on my YouTube channel which allows you to install a web part which will um, pop up onto the home page of an internet. So as you land on it, it'll come up with a message. And again, this is something that comes all the time from internet managers, comms managers, marketing managers, who say we have an urgent message that people must see it before they continue on through the, 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 the wider internet. And that app does actually allow you to do that. So if that's something that you're interested in, as I, I literally this week, I think it was posted a video about that. Awesome. I, I have a one question about design. What do you think about uh, pages which are very long? So if somebody needs to look for a content, and let's say th the content he needs to scroll three times to the bottom uh, to to find the, the the special link. So. I know there's possibilities like collapsible sections where you can group things and do things, but um, m lots of modern pages, people, you need to scroll down a lot to get to the content, or maybe if you click on something, it brings you to the section of the page where it's specifically done. But uh, maybe you need something not too long or not too short, something in the it's, middle. Um, yeah, so so it, it depends... A lot of these things, as a consultants, we always make this joke, don't we? Say it depends. It depends. Um, yeah. It depends. Um, th there was a kind of a bit of a shift, though, in the UX, and I say a bit of a shift. It, this is a long time ago that this 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 idea changed. Yeah. Um, it went from it's gone full circle. So originally, when web pages were first created and things like that, they were just really one really long page. 
And then people thought, I don't like this idea of scrolling. And some genius thought that people don't engage with sites when they have to scroll. And I'm not just talking about SharePoint, I'm talking about general websites. Yeah. So that then encouraged people to create loads of pages with a navigational link. And that's where this concept of wiki pages and SharePoint essentially evolved from that people would have thousands of wiki pages, which were all small, little, tiny things that linked together. The problem with that is that there's a lot of clicking. And again, then there was a study from, from a user experience point of view, which said that if people have to click more than three times, they'll abandon the search of what they're looking for. So actually getting more content on a page was, was better. Then there was this kind of halfway house idea, and we saw this in modern websites, and then it came through to SharePoint, that we have different colored sections. So see, see this section here at the top has got a kind of grayish background. Then I'm using this darker gray, and I'm alternating the colors of the backgrounds as I scroll through the page. And that's just kind yeah. of visually tell people that the context of the content that they're viewing has changed. It's no longer the same. Okay. So rather than me oh. breaking that content out onto a different page, I'm subtly changing the, the context on the same page. So there's not loads of scrolling. As you say, the idea of having to scroll about three times probably feels about the maximum. Um, but I'm kind of breaking the page up so it doesn't just feel like it's one big chunk of information. Does that make sense? Very much. No, Thank yeah. you. Definitely. Cool. Okay, I also have one uh, mistake to avoid that I want to mention, and uh, I mentioned it a little bit earlier, since I am a Power Platform consultant working with Power Apps and Power BI and Power Automate and so on all day long. Um, we also have a lot of customers that decide to go with, uh, with, with SharePoint lists as a backend. And you know that when you create a new SharePoint list column, if you write like, um, like a space or a dash or something like that, the internal name will have to somehow translate that dash or space with a, I don't know, like a percentage D and so on and so forth. And, and the problem with that is that you as a, as a front, as a user, you don't see that you see that display name and you see, uh, when using it, just that display name, but for the developer who has to work with those columns in canvas apps, writing that it's, it's still code, it's still low code, but it's still code. Um, it's a bit a, it's a bit of a pain when you have to find those columns because they have it's that a nightmare. Yeah. It's so a nightmare. As, and what I mentioned before is that when you create a new uh, SharePoint list from Excel, for example, you have an Excel sheet and then you want to have that as a, as a list, you can do that as well. Very helpful. But if you want to use that list later on as a as a, for a Power Apps canvas or so, on, and you want to work with those columns, maybe you will select a couple of them or so 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 and so forth. Um, it's it's no help at all. So you you have those messed up column names. So if you want to use SharePoint list as a back end, create the columns yourself. No? Use them, mm -hmm. name them without any spacing. Just put the the two words together, and then you can go on afterwards and rename that display name. No? So you want to to see them nicely, but that will make your life a lot easier by way when you work with them uh, later on on the Canvas app. So that's my tip. Brilliant. Very good. Very good. Okay, I think uh, I think we are almost at the end. I just want to ask one more question. You have also a YouTube channel, and you are also an MVP. Maybe you can share a couple of uh, words around that. How you achieved it? What mm. what uh, what's your YouTube about? You mentioned that's uh, all about Chapman and so yeah. on. Maybe a couple of words more, and then yeah. we can we can move to closing. Cool. So yeah, so as I say, I am a Microsoft MVP. Um, I like to think of myself. <laughs> I like to think of myself as probably the the least technical MVP you'll ever meet, um, because I see my skill set more in the remit of being able to communicate and educate people rather than being overly technical. So um, let's say I, I don't write pro code. I don't do infrastructure and servers and networking and all that sort of I don't do any of that sort of stuff. Um, but my journey to being an MVP, I suppose, started before, way before I had my own YouTube channel because um, I, I struggled with, I, ironically, I kind of struggled with public speaking for a long time. And I started challenging myself to go to user groups and speaking at user groups and doing those types of things. Um, but if I'm totally honest, I am 
a bit introverted. Um, I, I don't really like going out to sort of busy places and things like that. But I did enjoy kind of sharing my knowledge and, and, and training people and that sort of stuff. And especially during the kind of COVID period of time, sort of 2019, 2020, I was doing a lot of SharePoint training virtually anyway. So sometimes a few times a day, I'd be doing the same training session to people online and training them, that sort of stuff. And I kind of just thought that those types of skills would transfer quite well into YouTube. And yeah. at the time, the, the 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 company that I work for, I still work for, I've been there for seven, seven years, um, I set up their YouTube channel, um, their, their company called Valto, um, and they and I set up videos there again about SharePoint, um, about Power Apps, things like that. We're starting to do more videos around Copilot and AI and things like that nowadays. Um, and I started to build out and, and I started to see how it all works. So I kind of cut my teeth on the job. Uh, that expression basically means I learned on the job, essentially. Um, yeah. <laughs> in case it didn't it's water. <laughs> yeah. um so so yeah so i kind of learned by doing it for my company and started building that out and it is actually a sort of a lead generation engine so people now reach out to us and and sort of say oh we'd like something like that bill and that sort of stuff um and then at the time i spoke to um i had a few friends who were mvps um who, who i was friends with before they were mvps and um, I basically said to them, look, I'm doing all this kind of community stuff. Um, what do you think? And they basically said it won't be considered by the MVP program because it's being published um, essentially for the benefit of your company rather than just doing it, sort of getting out yeah, there. Yeah. Um, so that's when I was like, okay, well, I obviously now need to start my own YouTube channel and in my own time. So, so now... Um, and Amy even said to me the, the, the day on WhatsApp, when do you sleep? Um, because I don't yeah. really. Um, <laughs> um, so so typically I, I will get up um, quite early in the morning um, and I'll work on creating YouTube videos maybe about 7 o'clock in the morning to about 8 o'clock in the morning most days, um, whether it be for my own YouTube channel, whether it be for Balta's YouTube channel, um, things like that. Uh, but I did that and I consistently did it for about, a year to get noticed and then it was actually somebody i worked with a long time ago who wasn't an mvp he was a he's a full-time microsoft um employee who put me forward so to be an mvp um you either need to be recommended by an mvp or a full-time microsoft employee so he's right. a full-time microsoft employee he put me forward i went through and then you have to go through I, I, again got to be careful with NDAs of what you say, but you do have to go through a number of kind of steps to, to get the MVP award. Um, and through that, they, they really dig into everything you've been doing and what you've been publishing and making sure that you're consistent more than anything, that, that you you uh, put out content for a, a good period of time. So that And that's basically what they did. So they looked through. And somewhere in the process, so when I first started out my YouTube channel, um, and if you go right back to the beginning, the content is not, um, is it hasn't done that well. Um, and actually, the first 10 videos I did was about Microsoft Teams because I thought at the time that was probably what was going to be in the most high demand because, again, it was just coming out of COVID, people were using Teams. Yeah. It was a actually, lot of it was problems. The, the most hyped. Yeah. It still yeah. is. I, I must say, people use Teams uh, a lot. Yeah. So. But but for some reason, the content just didn't click. And I don't know quite why it didn't click, but it just didn't seem to resonate. So then I just thought, well, I'll create a couple of SharePoint videos because, to be honest, throughout everything, as I say, for the past 12 to 15 years or so, it has been about SharePoint in some way, shape, or form. So I thought, I'll put out a few SharePoint videos. So I put a few of those SharePoint videos out, and they started doing really well. And then I did a couple of Power Automate videos just to test the water, maybe a couple of Power Apps videos just to test the water. But it was the SharePoint ones, which was really coming out. So I was like, okay, there's obviously a lot of interest for SharePoint, a lot of demand. I know the most about SharePoint. I, I say, me personally, out of all the technical topics I know about, SharePoint, I definitely know more than about than Power Apps or anything like that. So that's why I thought I'd lean into that as my niche. Um, and actually, when I've spoken to a few other people who, are, who I would consider to be um, – really really top of their game when it comes to microsoft kind of 365 um youtube channels 
um, they encouraged me to 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 stick with a niche, to stick with SharePoint as a niche, and sort of really take it by the horns and and make a lot of content about that. So that's what I did. And um, as I said, after about a year, I got the MVP um, recognition for that. I'm coming up now. This will be I'm hopefully get it renewed. Um, and this would be my second year in. I think it was May that I originally got it last year. Um, so yeah, that's that's that was the kind of how I got to the MVP. Yeah. So do you, do you have to go, go through all those uh, steps again for the new renewal, or is it? I don't believe so. I don't believe so. Um, I, I think it's more. Um, you do have to submit everything you've done, so you do have to kind of have like a log book of of what you do, and they do check it. It's not like you win it once and then that's it forever again. But I think from what I understand, is it's more of a kind of check in on you're still active in the community, you're still providing value to the community, you're still yeah. following the guidelines and all that sort of stuff. Um, and that's essentially what they're kind of looking for, I believe. But it's still, yeah. a lot of it's still shrouded in a lot of mystery and and, um, <laughs> and, awesome. and whatever. Yeah. So. so, yeah, I, I, I also see a lot of, um, a lot of, yeah, interest on, on the SharePoint topic still. Because I am a I'm a power platform guy, but whenever I do a power platform video, like for example, only power apps or only power BI uh, on my YouTube channel, it gets nice, good views. But mm. anytime every anytime I combine it with a SharePoint, like with, uh, Power BI, uh, pull pull your SharePoint so, list in Power BI or so on and so yeah. forth, or, or do that with SharePoint and Power Automate. I mean, there are so many more views because people uh, like to combine these tools. Huh? So it's mm. it's all about that ecosystem. In, in mm. Microsoft that they they work and they want to to learn and they want to do stuff with it so it's yeah SharePoint it's a it's a big player and and I think in the grand scheme of things SharePoint's just been around a lot longer yeah. so the audience of the people that use it and are aware of it probably has just just because it's literally I can't even remember how long Power Platform's been around for but I think it's only like quarter of the time that SharePoint's been around for yeah, so the so Power BI is it's a bit older, but uh, yeah, yeah, and and dynamics, no model driven apps, mm. um, but but the rest is pretty new. Yeah. Awesome. Then we will yeah, make sure that we will link your your uh, LinkedIn and and YouTube, of course, in the video Thank description, you. so everybody can can find uh, your your channel and ours as well. Yep, sounds good. Okay, Amy, you have anything? Hey. To, uh, yeah, else, well, think, it, it was an uh, honor to, to have you as a as a guest, and uh, we, we hope you. to. Maybe we'll have uh, additional sessions and talk more technical and uh, take a, a subject and uh, talk about it. But uh, yeah. thank you so much for accepting our invitation to to be on yeah, the show. Thanks. Thank you very thank much you for, for sharing your journey and your insights. Bye, bye Thank you, everyone. Have a nice day.